Good morning. It is good to see you at the Lord's house for our worship this morning. The order of service is printed for you in the service folder that you received when you came in from the usher. Because we only have one service now in the summertime and we are celebrating our Lord's Supper today, we will sing a distribution hymn during the Lord's Supper. So we'll sing uh, Jesus, Your Blood and Righteousness, number 376. So please be aware of that. As we're celebrating our Lord's Supper, communicants, please take the opportunity to register using the cards in the back of the pew in front of you. And for all who are here this morning, in your pew you'll find this little black booklet. Take a moment and fill it out. Pass it along to those who are in the pew with you. Let's begin with our opening hymn, number 172, Up Through Endless Ranks of Angels. heart and confess our sins, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to forgive us. Lord of life, I confess that I am by nature dead in sin, for faithless worry and selfish pride, for sins of habit and sins of choice, for the evil that I have done and the good I have failed to do. You should cast me away from your presence forever. O oh Lord, I am sorry for my sins. Forgive me for Jesus' sake. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. In his great mercy, God made us alive in Christ Jesus, even when we were dead in our sins. So, hear the word of Christ through his called servant. I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. <clears throat> For the well-being of all people everywhere, that they may receive from you all they need to sustain body and life, hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. 
for the spread of your life-giving gospel throughout the world, that all who are lost in sin may be brought to faith in you. Hear our prayer, O Christ. Christ, have mercy. For patience and perseverance in this life, that we may not lose the hope of heaven as we await your return. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Lord of life, live in us that we may live for you. Amen. Amen. Your Son, our Savior, was taken up in glory and intercedes for us at your right hand. Through your living and abiding word, give us hearts to know him and faith to follow where he has gone, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Our Lord and our God speaks to our hearts in his word. Our first reading is from the New Testament book of Acts, in chapter 1. I wrote my first book, Theophilus, about everything Jesus began doing and teaching until the, until the day he was taken up, after he had given instructions to the Holy Spirit, to the apostles he had chosen. After he had suffered, he presented himself alive to the apostles with many convincing proofs. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days, and told them things about the kingdom of God. Once when he was eating with them, he commanded them, Do not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for what the Father promised, which you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they were together with him, they asked, Lord, is this the time when you are going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. After he said these things, he was taken up while they were watching. And a cloud took him out of their sight. They were looking intently into the sky as he went away. Suddenly two men in white clothes stood beside them. They said, Men of Galilee, why are you standing here, looking up into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. 
Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mountain called the Mount of Olives, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. When they entered the city, they went to the upstairs room where they were staying. Peter and John were there, also James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas the son of James. All of them kept praying together with one mind, along with the women, with Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. This is the word of the Lord. The psalm today is Psalm 8. We'll sing the verses responsibly. Dear friends, do not be surprised by the fiery trial that is happening among you to test you, as if something strange were happening to you. Instead, rejoice whenever you are sharing in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may rejoice and be glad when His glory is revealed. If you are insulted in connection with the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the Spirit of glory of God rests on you. Make sure that none of you suffers as a murderer, a thief, a criminal, or as a meddler. But if you suffer for being a Christian, do not be ashamed. But praise God in connection with this name. For the time has come for judgment to begin with the household of God. Now if it begins with us, what will be the end for those who disobey the gospel of God? Therefore humble yourselves under God's powerful hand, so that he may lift you up at the appointed time. Cast all your anxiety on Him, because He cares for you. Have sound judgment. Be alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Resist Him by being firm in the faith. You know that the same kinds of sufferings are being laid on your brotherhood all over the world. After you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace who called you into his eternal glory in Christ Jesus will himself restore, establish, strengthen, and support you. To him be the glory and power forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord.
Gospel of St. John, chapter 17. Glory be to you, O Lord. Our prayer of our Savior will be the focus for the sermon. After Jesus had spoken these things, he looked up to heaven and said, Father, the time has come. Glorify your Son, so that your Son may glorify you. For you gave him authority over all flesh, so that he may give eternal life to all those you have given him. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you sent. I have glorified you on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. Now, Father, glorify me at your own side with the glory I had at your side before the world existed. I revealed your name to the men you gave me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me. And they have held on to your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. For I gave them the words you gave me, and they received them. They learned the truth that I came from you. They believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, because they are yours. All that is mine is yours, and what is yours is mine. And I am glorified in them. I am no longer going to be in the world, but they are still in the world. And I am coming to you. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. Please be seated. The hymn of the day is number 359. Jesus, my great high priest.
Witnesses and pictures captured her stumbling from the crowd wearing the runner's bib. And she finished first of all the women. And she smashed. The, her record would still stand to this day as the fastest women's Boston Marathon ever run. It would have been the third fastest in all the world. It took eight days for officials to figure out what she had done. And her glory only lasted that long as she fell into the glorious light. But I'll think about the glory that was robbed from the one who did win the Boston Marathon in 1980. They actually restaged the finish the next week. They brought in 3,000 spectators and had a line the finish line there in Boston so she could run through and pictures could be captured of her winning with a crowd. That certainly could not be the same as if it actually happened during the race. And so there was glory. Glory lost and <clears throat> glory finally received. When it comes to a marathon, the one who wins is certainly put in the glory spotlight, but also if you just finish, it's also a glorious place. And that is where we are today. We are at the end of our Easter celebration. We are at the end of this time of the church when we have focused on the life of Jesus from birth to death, to life to ascension. And at the end, we have both the finish and a victory. And we find ourselves in glory. Our Lord and Savior prays for this glory the night before he died. And that was our gospel text. That prayer of Jesus is only recorded in John's Gospel. We are more familiar with Matthew, Mark, and Luke, who tell us Jesus went, you know, his disciples were falling asleep. He went off the side and said, Father, if it is your will, let this cup pass, but if it is not, then I will suffer. But then he opens up into this part of his prayer, which we call his high priestly prayer. And you may be Maybe you're remembering all the offices of our Lord Jesus Christ that we learned in Catechism. Jesus is our prophet, priest, and king, right? And so he functions as our high priest because as the priests do, priests pray. They intercede before God. They go between. And this is how Jesus functions. He's gone into heaven now, right? He didn't enter his retirement. He's not sitting on a lazy boy. But every day, he functions as our high priest. And this prayer is always being lifted up to the Heavenly Father for glory. Glory in finishing. Glory in victory. Jesus knows what's about to happen to him. He knows what his work is. What he has been sent by the Father to do. He knows that as he accomplishes it, what the result is going to be, the Father is going to be glorified, he's going to be glorified, and his people are going to receive glory. But now we think of glory. This is not earthly glory, where there are a bunch of people cheering and there are spotlights and celebrations. But just think of the suffering and death of our Lord Jesus. Yes, there is glory there in the most inglorious way. And we know why Jesus' glory work has to happen in such an inglorious way, because it is dirty work. Think about the function of the high priest in the Old Testament. What did he do day in and day out? But sacrifice. And what was upon his hand? Oh, this is dirty, and this is stinking work. We know Jesus' glory work is going to be dirty, inglorious work. Because the reason why he's doing it is sin. And we learn something about sin here, don't we? If Jesus' glory work is this dirty and this inglorious, we know, we know what sin really is. 
We know there's no such thing as a greater sin or a lesser sin to any degree when it comes to God's view of sin. Yes, there may be degrees on how my sin impacts those around me, right? But not in God's eyes, for every sin there is one judgment that requires one punishment and one price. And to win that is going to be inglorious and going to be dirty. And it's going to be messy. For all sins. For any sin. From coveting to cursing. From greed to gossip. From lying to lust. From neglect of the word. From neglect of my neighbor's needs. Each and every one of them requires this kind of work. And often the dirty work, the inglorious work, is absolutely necessary. Somebody's got to do it. They think of some of those kinds of jobs in the TV show, right? Dirty jobs. You think of the chores around your house, right? Somebody's got to pick up the dog food. Somebody's got to pump the porta potties. Somebody's got to change the stinky diapers. It's just imagine if there was nobody to do these things. And there is no glory in such work. And yet they're absolutely necessary. And so as we may have in our mind's eye that picture of Jesus in Gethsemane with his elbows and hands upon the rock and his face glowing and the beams coming down from heaven, that's not what the high priestly prayer is like. But in desperation, he was on his face likely in the ground, begging for glory. A glory somebody had to win. Only one could win. Jesus knew. He was the only one to carry out this glory work. And we see this in the garden, why this is, right? It's remarkable. God is praying to God for the completion of God's saving work. Absolutely necessary for the sinner. Nobody else could do it. Somebody's got to do it. It's only Him. And here Jesus puts Himself in that place. As the great high priest, not only to offer a sacrifice, but to offer Himself as the sacrifice. Not to dirty his hands in the blood of another, but the blood that comes from himself. Somebody's got to do it. There's only one who did it. And where do we find glory here? Jesus prays in his prayer, and it's always where we find glory. He cried out on the cross, right? In glory, it is finish. There is glory at the finish. Because Jesus has done what no one else could do. And he has won victory over sin and death and the devil. That's why he goes into heaven as we celebrate on Thursday. And returns to his full glory as true God. <laughs> Jesus' glory work is finished. It's done. And as he prays, we see, right? He's bringing glory to the Father. He's also being glorified himself as being the Savior of sinners, the only one to be the Savior of sinners. And this is a glory he gives those who belong to him. And did you catch how Jesus prayed for that? Father, glorify yourself. Father, glorify Jesus. Glorify me. As I bring those that belong to you into eternal life. What more glorious thing is there than that? Jesus' glorious work is done to bring us glory of life everlasting. But, you notice that Jesus didn't look at the glory of heaven 
when he talked about eternal life. How did he define eternal life? Eternal life is a true knowledge of the one true God. A knowledge which can only happen and is only possible by knowing Him as the Savior. <clears throat> knowing this true God as the God who so loved the world that did not deserve it and who so loved us who deserve none of it. For all our inglorious acts of sin that we have seen scattered throughout of our life, from cursing to coveting, lies and lust and greed and gossip and neglect of the word and neglect of neighbors and neighbors, all of them. This is true knowledge of the true God and know that he sent his one and only son to die. This is eternal life. And this is glory. Jesus' glory work is done. And Jesus' glory work is ours. As we know him to be our Savior who is finished. Who wins. This glory is so different than the glory of this world. Think of the glory of the one who wins. Soon in a couple of weeks... Most important championship happening first, the NHL, in the next couple of weeks, right? The glory of holding the Stanley Cup above your head. They will celebrate for maybe a week and then it's back to work again because that glory only lasts and you have to win it again another year. Or if you're running a marathon and you're not counting on winning but counting on finishing, well then, you have to decide, am I going to run again? The glory of this world lasts for a moment. And is always fleeting. But not the glory for which Jesus begs and prays for in his high priestly prayer. <clears throat> Jesus' glory work is done. And now listen to him pray. I am glorified in them. The glory work keeps on. And in a very remarkable way, isn't it? I am glorified in them. Think about that. Jesus doesn't need glory to be brought to himself. He is God. He has ascended in his exaltation to the full power and glory of God. He has lived perfectly. He has died for all. He has come from the grave. How, how in the world can I add more glory to that? Listen to him pray. I am Glorify in them. Glory comes to Jesus in those he has come to save. Jesus' glory work is done in us. And how is that done in us? Look at what Jesus focuses on. The glory work is done in us and the reality that those who belong to him do not belong to this world, do not belong to the devil, but live in this world as set apart. As the people that the Father has chosen them to be in his Son. They don't fit in. They don't follow. How is that possible? Again, look at what Jesus prays. Jesus' glory work is done in us when those who follow him hold on to your word. Jesus' glory work is done in us only in that connection, in our relationship with the word because that is the only way that we are connected to the one who has now gone into heaven. That is the only way that he connects himself to us while we are here in this life. As he said, I am going away. They stay here. Here's how I stay in them and they in me as one. 
And it's no surprise here, the Holy Spirit uses a word to describe our relationship with God's word that can be translated about 15 different ways. It is the most comprehensive word at looking at our relationship with God's word. They have held on to your word. Well, how does that look? What do we hold on to? Hold on to children who are precious to us. To protect them. Because we love them. We hold on to the things that are valuable to us. They mean something to us. We won't let anybody take it away from us. This is how we bring glory to Jesus. Because He is that Word. And He is that much to us. Other translations say that when Jesus prays here, they have obeyed your Word. Of course. This is exactly how we're going to be set apart from that sinful world and from the control of the devil. By keeping and obeying God's word, especially when he tells us, this is what I want, this is how my people are going to live. We know what Jesus said. Let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Jesus' glory work is done in us as we live under him in his kingdom and serve him and keep his word and obey his word. And in this we will also be exactly what Jesus says we will be. Before he raised his hand in blessing at his ascension, he told his disciples, this is what's going to happen. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Jesus' glory work is done in us. As we are witnesses of what he has done to save us from our sins. We are witnesses of his death, and of his resurrection, and of his glorious ascension. And we wait to witness is coming again. And even then, the glory does not. Yeah. So here we are. We put the light out on Thursday when our Lord ascended. And our celebration of our Lord's life, our salvation, is now a thing. It is finished. And he has won. And we find ourselves in glory. Because Jesus' glory work is done. And Jesus' glory work is done in us. Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Please stand. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who calls you faithful, and he will do it. Amen. With one heart and voice, let us confess our faith with the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. And his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated.
Let us pray. For the whole church of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord, and for all, according to their names. <coughs> Lord God, ruler of all, protect and defend your church from every attack the devil prowls and seeks to devour. Where he tempts, strengthen your people to resist his seductions and terrors. Where he gains a foothold with false teaching or ungodly living, call them to repentance and to holiness. Where he incites enemies against your word and church, preserve your saints in the faith, so they might rejoice to share in the sufferings of Christ. Almighty God, you provided your apostles as witnesses to your saving work. And now provide for your church pastors and missionaries that the gospel of Jesus Christ might be proclaimed at home and to the ends of the earth. Protect them and their families from every attack of the evil one. Console them in their trouble and keep them steadfast in the faith. Holy God, faithful Creator, remember all who are suffering illness, affliction, or injuries of any kind. Grant healing and recovering according to your holy will. Strengthen their faith by word and sacrament, and protect them from every assault of the evil one upon body, mind, and soul. King of kings, you arise to protect your people and scatter your enemies. Have mercy on all those who serve or have served in the armed forces of our nation as your instruments for our peace and safety. Protect them from all evil, sustain them in times of anxiety and violence, and grant them repentant hearts and rejoice in the peace won by Christ and his victory for them. As our nation collectively hangs its head in silence this weekend, we too remember and give thanks to you for those you raised up in service to our country and the protection of the blessings you have given to us and who gave their lives. We rejoice for those who died in Jesus on the field and that you have brought them to the mansions of the Lord. Father, as your Son prayed that your people might be one, united in heart and faith, even as you are one with him, as you gather your people now in the one faith by baptism, so grant to them a united confession of your truth as they receive Jesus' body and blood in the sacrament. And Heavenly Father, as the first Christians devoted themselves to prayer and worship, following the departure of Jesus by means of his glorious ascension, preserve your church in the same until we are raised up with all the saints to your heavenly kingdom. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is good and right so to do. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord. Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who rose from the dead in glorious triumph to bring forgiveness to the world and everlasting life to all who believe. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. Celebrate with joy the glorious resurrection of your Son, 
We marvel at the depth of your love. We stand in awe of your power. We are humbled by the compassion you've shown our fallen race. Lead us to rejoice in the pardon offered in the seal of this sacrament and live a life worthy of your name. The Lord Jesus lives. Alleluia. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen.
Please stand. We join to sing the song of Simeon. Thank you. 